the mic. Your Excellency, members of the Board of the Institute, distinguished guests, colleagues and friends, it's a great honor for me to welcome you all to the 26th annual meeting of the Dean's Institute of Athens uh, at the Acropolis Museum. And I want to start by thanking the director, Dr. Manalis, for the honor of, well, for the gesture of hosting us here tonight. Uh, but to mark the occasion, I want to start by giving the word to the chairman of our board, Dr. Bondi. Please. Thank you very much, Your Excellency, distinguished guest, ladies. Sorry, I'm too small. Maybe, maybe if I, I stand like this, is it okay? You can see me now. Good. I start again, Your Excellency. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, 2017 was a very important year for the Danish Institute at Athens. We celebrated our 25th anniversary and received in that connection from the Karlsborg Foundation a postdoc for which we are deeply grateful. Subsequently, Nikolai van Eggers Marigo has joined the scientific staff and is working on a project about Aristotle and political philosophy, thus adding a new dimension to the scientific work uh, at the Institute. The director, Dr. Christina Winter Jakobsen, will tell you more about the project in her annual report. Mm -hmm. Last year, I could also announce that we had received a generous donation from the Maersk Foundation, enabling the Institute to search for new accommodation for the growing numbers of scholars, artists and students who want to study here at Athens. At this year's anniversary, I am able to tell that our search came to a successful conclusion in the fall of 2017, where we found and bought a house well suited to our purpose, not too far from the Institute's residence at Hellefondos, actually two stops with the metro at uh, Neos Cosmos. Tonight, I have furthermore the privilege and pleasure to announce that the Institute in 2018 has received a generous donation uh, and from one from the New Casper Foundation and another from the Velux Foundation. I shall therefore wholeheartedly give my thanks to the New Casper Foundation for enabling us to furnish the new building with modern Danish furniture and other equipment, thus creating a beautiful, homely and inspiring environment for the residents in which they can work and meet their Greek friends and colleagues. The Institute is much concerned with the environment and we are therefore very grateful for the donation from the Velux Foundation that gives us the possibility to choose sustainable solutions for the renovation of the house. The renovation will be finished in August this year. And if this was not enough, I have a minute ago received a, a message that just the Inbound Fund also will bestow a donation upon us. I don't have the details, it's quite a new <laughs> announcement, but next year you will hear more about it. But thank you to uh, the Foundation. To accommodate Danish scholars, artists and students and help them in fulfilling their projects in Greece is one of the most important purposes of uh, the Institute. So on behalf of the board of the Institute, I express my deep gratitude to the two, three foundations. We look forward to show you the result uh, of your generosity. Thank you very much. Last night, I and the rest of uh, the board had the opportunity to visit 
the new building. After looking at plans and drafts for a long time, it was a truly wonderful experience to see the house in full size. It is completely clear that it fulfills all, all our expectations. I shall therefore use this occasion to um, thank the director, the amanuensis, the whole staff of the institute for uh, the hard work they have put into making the building uh, almost finished for the residents. Um, you have all worked very hard, but I'm sure that the future residents will be grateful for your job. So, well, well done indeed, and thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. So, the remaining program has four parts. First, I will report on the activities of the Institute in 2017. This will be followed by a musical intermezzo. Then Dr. Björn Löfven will give the announced lecture. And at the end of the evening, we ask invited guests to join us for a reception at the Danish Institute. I wish to... So, I hear a whistle. Am I the only one who hears the whistle? No. Can we... Adjust the sound maybe a little bit. Do I have to try to lower my voice? So, I wish to start by thanking the Hellenic Ministry of Culture and Sports for our excellent collaboration in 2017. Gratitude is due specifically to General Secretary of Culture, Dr. Maria Andrea Dati Vlasaki. Director of the General Directorate of Antiquities, Dr. Elin Gorka. Director of the Directorate of Prehistory and Classical Antiquities, Dr. Elin Kuntaguri. Director of the Directorate of Byzantine and Post-Byzantine Antiquities, Dr. Susanna Julia Capelloni. Mrs. Constantina Benisi, Supervisor of the Archaeological Institutions, and Mrs. Joria Fakar. I also wish to extend our deepest gratitude to the efforts with which we worked in 2017. To Dr. Olympia Ricardo, therefore of the antiquities of Etulia, Arcanania, and Ricarda. Dr. Eleni Papadopoulou, therefore of antiquities of Hania. Dr. Anayota Kasimi, therefore of antiquities of Corinth. Dr. Stella Kishuraki, therefore of West Attica, Piraeus, and the Islands. Dr. Andrea Staralas, Effort of Paleoanthropology and Speleology, and Dr. Angeliki Simusi, former Effort of the Underwater Antiquities. 2017 was indeed a big year for us, the 25th anniversary of the Danish Institute of Ethics. I should also like to take this opportunity to express my personal gratitude to the staff of the Institute for the effort to make not only the anniversary, but in fact every year a special occasion and for their strong commitment to the Institute. The activities of the Danish Institute of Ethics can be divided into four categories. The residencies, the cultural program, education and research. And I have made a selection intended to represent the width of our activities. Over the past year, we have hosted 43 artists, teachers, authors, and scholars. The residency is sponsored by the New Carlsberg Foundation and the Gates and Gell Foundation, to whom we're very grateful. They have also supported nine students in residence. As mentioned by the chairman of the board, in 2017, we received a grant from the EP Müller of Hustle, Shestina McKinney Müller's Fund to help me forward to purchase a new guest house and in October, we bought Magina number one in Leo's Cosmos. The house required complete renovation, and we have come a very long way. As also mentioned, we have recently received additional grants from the New Carlsberg Foundation and the Rhodes Foundation to complete the project 
beyond our wildest dreams, in fact, for which we are very grateful, and I am looking forward to presenting the final outcome next year's annual meeting. Here you see that a little bit of a preview before and after, but the major changes are really inside the house. In 2017, we started our film club featuring screenings of Danish movies introduced by film historian Dr. Joanna Athanasato in collaboration with the Danish Embassy. The film club has provided a welcome addition to our usual audience and the screenings are usually followed by a lively debate. We are grateful to the Embassy for this collaboration. Always keen to reach a new audience, the Institute also participated in the Open Walk Athens, an organized walking tour of Athens to visit selected locations, when in fact more than 300 people the Institute. Also in October, the Institute hosted the Danish Greek quartet Kotas on their tour of Greece. Kotas' debut album was the winner of the Danish Radio P2 Listeners Award of 2017, and the Athenian audience responded equally enthusiastically to the marriage of Greek and Danish musical traditions. The 2017 cultural program is sponsored by the Danish Agency for Culture, to which we are very grateful. The main educational event of 2017 was the training course for Danish gymnasium teachers of classics in February, supported by the Games and Bell Foundation, to which we are very grateful. The 2017 course involved making short films for flipped classroom as you can see in these images. These teachers are very important to the work of the Institute. Every spring and autumn, Athens is invaded by Danish Tunisian classes, and many of them make their way to the Institute for a lecture co hosted with the Danish Embassy. These events provide us with an important opportunity to promote academic studies of the Greek world and recruit a new generation of scholars, teachers, and artists with a deep appreciation of what the Greek world can offer. We are grateful to the Embassy for their commitment to this important activity and to the Danish Ministry of Education for their financial support. The research activities include resident scholarships, lectures, conferences, publications, individual research projects and field work. Volume 9 of the Proceedings of the Danish Institute appeared in 2017 and includes an article on the fieldwork of Air Katzen and Gladys and Van Hussing on the infrastructure of the construction of the 4th century temple of Apollo at Delphi. Regrettably, Air Katzen did not see the article in print as he passed away on the last day of 2016. We honor the memory of this remarkable man and school. Three volumes in monograph series also appeared in 2017, including two conference volumes dedicated to the wider context of the pre- and proto-palatial cemetery at Petras Dias, and to the material carnet of the Greek world in the geometric and area. The final volume in the publication, uh, oh, sorry, the final volume is the publication of the fieldwork of Nelson Dyson, Nota Pantsu, and Dimitris Papadopoulos, on Mamapilia, supported by the Independent Danish Research Council. The Pilion Cave Project is the first attempt to systematically map the caves on Pilion for both ethnographic and archaeological purposes, and it provides new insight into a not so liminal economy of the mountains way into the 20th century. We thank the effort of paleoanthropology and speleology on the Estados for his support. Though currently inactive in the field, the Seahawk project has been vigorously disseminating its result to the wide world, including an academic lecture series in the US. The project featured extensively in episode two of the documentary Naos, the history of Greek seamanship and shipbuilding from prehistory until modern times. For nine days in May and June 2017, the area of the Seahawk ship ships in Korea was convinced.
converted into an escape room when Urban Game locked Return for the second time. Urban Game is part of ICOM's International Music Day, and it is an event that combines gaming, art, culture, and the digital environment to reconnect the archaeological sites with the surrounding urban environment. Using the latest technology for interactive and educational experiences, it helps visitors understand the ancient remains and their functions, as well as the development of the historical landscape through the ages. At the same time, it tries to redefine the local community's relationship with the archaeological site, highlighting its symbolic importance and transforming the site into a dynamic center of modern life, a place for meeting, learning, playing, and research using the past to look to the future. For the fourth year in a row, the discoveries of the Lakaian Harbour project went around the world and were featured in prestigious newspaper media, such as The Guardian, for an English-speaking audience, and in online magazines such as National Geographic Spain for a Spanish-speaking audience. The Lakaian Harbour project also featured in the documentary Neos in episode 3, focusing on Singapore trade and activity. In January 2017, Nicolai Vanegas Marie Igor started his postdoc at the Institute. The postdoc provided an opportunity to broaden the research scope of the Institute, and we're very grateful to the Carlsberg Foundation for this birthday present. The title of the project of Marie Igor is Popular Sovereignty and the Political Ontology of Aristotle. Marie Igor aims to provide both a philosophical and historical analysis analysis sorry, of conceptions of sovereignty, democracy, and political change focused around the concepts of kyrias, stasis, and metaboli in ancient Greek thought and political practice. The research project <coughs> Rediscovering Artemis, which was initiated in 2016 by Sina Bathwell, yielded fascinating results in 2017. Rediscovering Artemis concerns the study and publication of the pottery and votives of the 1920s and 30s excavation of the Artemis Lafria sanctuary in Canada. The excavations were a joint Danish Greek project carried out by Frederick Poulton, Constantinus Myers, and Ina Dupont. The architecture and topography were published in 1948, but the pottery and votives were never published. And it is this task that Buffalo is aiming to complete. The most exciting result so far is the discovery of Mycenaean pottery in the assemblage. More than 100 individual vessels, not mostly drinking cups, but also craters, bowls, and jugs, predominantly dating to the late these vessels were perhaps used and feasted by local rulers in the area before the construction of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. The Artemis Lafria sanctuary was instituted in the geometric period, attested to, among other finds, this Tapsus ware pottery, probably imported from the region of Ohio across the Gulf from Hanover. Imports continued in the archaic and classical periods, Exemplified by artifacts from Corinth, Attica, as well as Ilium, Black Clears, Lekithor. Local or regional pottery was also recovered from this image. Most remarkable are the fragments of a very unusual phallus writer. It depicts a sex scene in black figure technique and had a satyr head and relief attached on the upper part of the vessel. Such vessels were probably used in specific rituals of Dionysian nature. And if you're wondering, because I had to take a look at myself, you can actually see two sets of legs. Yeah. All the pottery from the Artemis Sanctuary excavation has been processed and is being prepared for publication. In 2017, the Danish Institute of Athens administered three field permits and one study permit. A Galilean 
work continued in collaboration with the effort of Antiquities of Etulia of Romania and Ilkada under the direction of the effort of Olympia Bicato and Sean Henbert from the University of Oslo. In 2017, the project continued the study and conservation of the finds from the excavations of the Hellenistic House and the fortifications of the lower Acropolis carried out in 2013 to 16. <coughs> One of last year's aims was to characterize the clay fabric groups in the ceramic assemblages through microscopic analysis. The clay of 550 shirts were photographed using a digital microscope, which led to the identification of more than 50 distinct fabrics. Using local reference material, including misfire portrait, the project has been able to identify the fabric used in the local manufacture of Hellenistic fibers. The project plans to continue the work with more extensive chemical studies in the near future. The study of the animal bones excavated from the Lake Geometry and the Cake Fill of the Acropolis Fortification Wall in 2014 was another important task in 2017. Almost a thousand bone fragments were studied, and species were identified when possible. This assemblage of animal bones is highly significant because it provides unique evidence for reconstructing the dietary practices during the early occupation of the city. The study of cut marks on the bones revealed that the main meat consumption of the inhabitant consisted of pigs, cattle, sheep, sheep sorry, and goats. But the study also showed that wild animals such as birds, red deer, and The project continued the documentation of monuments and structures in the ancient city with the aim of producing a new and detailed topographical map of the entire ancient city. The photogrammetry model of the whole archaeological area was created based on aerial photography. In an attempt to document structures in areas with heavy vegetation, the project employed infrared and ultraviolet imagery which allows the identification of monuments in otherwise inaccessible areas. Through a combination of GPS recording of monuments and structures in the landscape since 2015, aerial photography, and the digital elevation model, the project is now in the final phase of producing the detailed site plan that will provide new insights into the city's ancient topography. In 2017, a section of the northern fortification wall was also documented in detail. <coughs> the elevation drawing clearly shows that the wall was repaired in the eastern part, presumably in the Hellenistic in a different construction style using smaller stone boats. This is the first time that repair works on the city's fortifications have been documented, and it supports the existing evidence that the Acropolis was the first part. The Lechayan Harbour project is a collaboration between the Ephraim of Underwater Antiquities, the University of Copenhagen, and the Danish Institute of Athens, directed by Dimitris Kodomelis and Jörg Wien. And this year, Wien, of course, will be presenting the project himself. The Greek Danish Synergasia studying the archaic classical movies of Sikion in the northeastern Peloponnese is directed by Konstantinos Kisas from the Ephraim of Antiquities of Corinth, and Silke Muth Fredriksen from the National Museum of Copenhagen. The main focus of the project is the urban fabric of the Pluto-Hellenistic city. After two years of surface studies, the first excavation season of five weeks was conducted in the summer of July 2017. In addition, supplementary geophysics Investigations, uh, a geoarchaeological survey by Chris Hayward from the University of Edinburgh, and an architectural study were carried out. Geomagnetic prospection was continued in order to define more precisely the borders of the settled area of Old Sikian in the north, northeast, and east. The area of the settlement of Sikian amounts to around 170 hectares, including suburban areas with thinner traces. 
Furthermore, geomagnetic and resistivity measurements are used to gather further indications for the likely course of the city wall north of the town and for the course of one of the main streets connecting the city to its harbour. Additionally, the topography of the harbour was further investigated. The seismic profile indicates a former water inlet of 25 to 30 meters width. The processing of the data is still in progress and promises further valuable information about the shape of security. The Geoarchaeological Survey comprised searches for quarries within the vicinity of the ancient city, searches for outcrops of meeting limestone in the area, as well as the study of the stone of architectural remains of the pre city. It was possible to identify quarry traces of soft bio and of conglomerate. The study of the architectural remains yielded a variety of mythologies, often combined within the same structures. Excavations were carried out in eight trenches in five different fields. The first three fields are located in the town centre, while the last two fields belong to suburban areas. In field one, a wall, oh, in field one, a wall from the late geometric early archaic period represents the oldest architectural remains of most of them discovered so far, but needs to be further investigated. <coughs> fragmented structures from the classical late Roman and Byzantine period, including a classical pedophile. Field 3, trench A. In field 3, trench A, two parallel walls at a distance of roughly 3.5 meters from each other were discovered, albeit of different construction faces. The northeastern wall is probably a classical thing made of monumental, finely dressed limestone blocks, which might indicate some of the building. Uh, in the Celtic or Pathetic. In trench B, two short parts of walls running roughly at a right angle came to light. Both are earlier than the late 4th century BC, but so far they're not connected to each other. The walls in field 3 all correspond to anomalies of geophysical. <coughs> in field 4, trench A revealed two parallel walls of different construction at a distance of roughly between the walls, a layer of high pebble concentration needs further investigation. On the southern edge of the trench, two probable graves appeared at the end of the season. The trench B, two walls diverging towards the east were on earth, again of different character. In the area in between, a large amount of pottery and other finds of the late 4th century BC were found. South of the southern wall, a possible road surface with pebble inclusions was recorded. The geomagnetic investigations <coughs> imply a road running north of the northern wall in trench A and south of the southern wall in trench B, bordered by walls on both sides. It is obvious that we are dealing here with a gold zone of old signal with a road leading out of the city in the direction The excavations in Field 5 yielded no architectural structures, but very interesting finds such as obsidian and flint fragments, pottery from the late 8th, early 7th century BC through to the Middle Hellenistic period, as well as fragments of mortar, stucco, and mosaic floors. The finds suggest that the area was inhabited not only during the occupation of Old City, but in fact also post it. In field 6, in the southwestern corner of the research area, a huge pile of ancient rocks used as spolia was nearly stripped to the ground. All the diagnostic architectural rocks, such as column drums and Doric frieze fragments, were arranged in a lapidarium and studied. The blocks come from at least two <coughs> or probably more ancient buildings in all likelihood of public and or cultic function. Excavations in the coming summer are intended to investigate the hypothesis of an ancient temple in the area. With the fieldwork of
of the 2017 season, the project was able to gather valuable information about pre-Hellenistic Sydney, its geology, topography, urban structure, and some of its private, public, and cultural buildings. The first uh, season of excavation generated a huge amount of ancient material of all sorts, which already now offers insights into the material culture of the town, providing valuable <coughs> Danish excavations at Hanya under the general direction of Maria Andrea Daki Vasaki, with Edmund Schelin and Eric Heller as co directors, was carried out in 2010, 13, and 14 with the purpose of excavating the remains of the LM3A2 B1 Building 2 at Kestel, shown in green on the plan. Since the last excavation season, work has focused mainly on the preparation and conservation the excavated material before the scientific studies can begin. This preliminary work was completed in 2017 and revealed some interesting results. The ongoing work on the detailed stratigraphy continued in 2017 and showed, among other things, that the late geometric period was very richly represented with both floor deposits and pits. Here represented by a pit in trench 32 containing the bottom of the geometric open vessel and the large part of the building frame. All soil samples collected from the excavation have been water sift and in 2017, Anaya Sarbaki continued her studies of the samples, classifying not only about uh, archaeobotanical remains, but also other artifacts which could not be seen by the naked eye during the excavation. In 2017, such items include reports from mice, snakes, eggshells, fish bones, and scales, an octopus tooth, snails, and insects. And the soil sample of the form that you can see here, taken from a floor deposit of the LM3B1 period, also contains tiny fragments of worked ivory, decorated pottery. Finally, the pottery includes a large number of complete or almost complete restored vessels. The work of making profile drawings of this material was begun by Birgitta Halle and here represented by two vessels of the LM3 period. The projects of the Danish Institute at Athens are indebted to the Carlsberg Foundation, the Augustinus Foundation, the Institute for Geo Prehistory, the Herbert and Karin Jacobsen Stiftung, the Elisabeth Munchkoff Foundation, and the Sven G. Fiedler and Wife Foundation for the financial support for our field work. And on behalf of everyone involved in our projects, from directors to students as well as institutions, I express again our sincere gratitude to the Great Minister of Culture and Sports, the Central Archaeological Council, and the National Museum, uh, the National Museum in Athens, and the efforts the support and collaboration and thus ends my report. So Pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Björn Wing, Associate Professor of Classical Archaeology at the University of Copenhagen. Björn Wing specializes in ancient harbors and submerged sites. He received his MA in Classical Archaeology from the University of Aarhus and his PhD from the University of London in 2009. Since 2001, Wing is the director of the SEA Harbor Project and since 2013, co-director of the Lechayan Harbour Project. Tonight, he will speak to us about Lechayan, the main harbour of ancient Corinth. Please go the podium. It's yours.
So everybody, do you copy? Can you hear me loud and clear back uh, on, in the back as well? Perfect. I'm just trying to find the mouse. There it is. Then I'm ready. <laughs> Dear friends and colleagues, good evening. Dear Christina Winder Jacobsen, thank you very much for the kind introduction and for the invitation to lecture here tonight. And thank you for being a great director to the Danish Institute. Thanking all the people and the institutions who have contributed in the success of the Lehigh Harbor project would make for a very long evening. Instead, I would like to single out the following. I wish to thank the effort of underwater antiquities, especially the former director, Dr. Simusi, the new director, Dr. Kalmara, our co-director, Dr. Gorgomelis, and our assistant directors, Ms. Mika and Mr. Athanasopoulos. I also wish to help to thank Dr. Kasimi, who's the F4 of the current effort, the land part of the site where we work. Last but not least, I would uh, like to single out two institutions, the Augustinus Foundation and the Carlsberg Foundation. Thank you very much for your generous funding. Actually, the Lechaienhaven project started in 2013. I had only received just under 3,000 euros from uh, Her Majesty Queen Margaret the Second's Archaeological Foundation, but I'm pretty stubborn, so I went into the field anyway with those 3,000 euros and some of my own money. And one sunny day when I was uh, bobbing around on the surface looking at some very interesting uh, wooden structures, Hamiluxis came running along the beach with uh, my phone in his hand, and I thought that's probably important because he that does, does not do that normally. So I swim in, do the stranded whale uh, on the beach, and he puts the phone to my ear, and I hear that we got the funding from the Augustinus Foundation, half of the funding. And I was, it, it was actually the funding would only be paid out if, uh, if I found the other half, which I didn't. But I was allowed to go into the field in, uh, in 14 on this funding, and then in 15, well, you know these American movies where you're hanging in a hand and tsk, over a cliff, it's dark and it's snowing and you have only two fingers on the last ledge. It's a man that steps out of, uh, of the darkness in a green suit, Carlsberg Green, and saves the project. Ancient Corinth was a hotbed of culture, business and pleasure, of black markets and dark vices, all of which attracted rich, with the rich and ambitious, uh, so is there light, because I'm half blind. from all over the Mediterranean and beyond. The sheer wealth that exchanged hands here gave rise to the ancient proverb, not everyone can afford to go to Corinth. The city-state was positioned on the isthmus between the Greek mainland and the Peloponnese, Peloponnesian Peninsula, and it connected, and it controlled, I really need some light, is there any light? Sorry about that. That is perfect. Bravo. I'm 
point years ago. The city-state was positioned on the isthmus between the Greek mainland and the Peloponnesian Peninsula, and it controlled shipping and trade between the eastern and western Mediterranean. In fact, around 600 BC, the city created a massive paved road, the Diolkos, to haul ships and cargo safely from one side of the isthmus to the other. Here you see an artistic reconstruction of a 12-meter merchant ship of the 6th century BC being hauled across the Diolkos. The merchant ship is based on the iconographic of the vessel depicted on this attic black figure Kylix. The Diolkos saved ships the roughly 500 kilometers long trip around the windswept Peloponnesian Peninsula, a perilous journey in treacherous waters. If you sail around Cap Malea, forget your home, writes the first century BC geographer Strabo, ominously in his description of the voyage south of the Peloponnese. Not everybody heeded this warning, and that the island of Antikythera, just south of, uh, of the Peloponnese, One famous ship, sorry, it's met its destiny in a deep watery grave. Here we see our friends and colleagues excavating the famous Roman period Antikythera shipwreck, laden with bronze statues. She did not make it. Lord Elgin's ship the mentor transporting sculptures from the Parthenon also sank in these waters. The Corinthians profited from this situation by charging large tolls to shippers. The gateway to the Grand Bazaar was the city's main harbor at the Chion, which teemed with life and commodity commodities from all over the known world. Silk from the Asia, wine from the Aegean, metal from Cyprus, and much more. Spanning three millennia, Lycaon was one of the most important centers of trade in the world during the Greek, Roman, Byzantine, Frankish, Ottoman, and Venetian periods, and a key point in the Greek War of Independence. Now we set sail for Lycaon, sailing through the Corinth Canal, and in the following, I'll offer an overview of our most important discoveries. If I, if I look a little concerned, it's because I'm sailing on a very famous sailing ship, and uh, it has been three, three times around the world, and I was, uh, I was afraid to have Danish newspaper uh, headlines saying, Danish archaeologist sinks the Norcap on. I'm used to motorboats, and here we're sailing through the famous Corinth Canal, constructed in uh, the late 18th century, but it fast went out of use. The Romans also tried to carve a channel through the Corinthian isthmus. So, here is the site as we uh, came to it in 2013. There's a very prominent uh, outer harbor, and there's an inner harbor which has this very organic shape connected with the, with the sea. And uh, also you can see here as a very important landmark, I'll have to stress that this is not excavated by us, this is the famous Leonidas, Leonidas Basilica of the 6th century AD. And uh, I mean, I remember the first time I was uh, standing on the beach looking over the sea and thinking that this was uh, this was the space that the Corinthians went down to the shoreline and in 734-33 launched their ships, went to Corfu and to Sicily and uh, founded, for example, uh, the important city of Syracuse. 
I'll give you an overview of the site. Here we are from the sea. You see these two horns. They are moles. We'll see them later. We go through the instrument channel, which is this area here and this area here. It goes into Harbor Basin 1 in this area here, and we have followed it for 205 meters. Harbor Basin 2 is 240 meters long. It's 200 meters wide, so just over 40,000 square meters. You should note this key that we have in this area here. It is built in the early Byzantine period, probably in the 6th century AD, I'll return to that. Then we have another canal, 150 meters long, connecting to this S-shaped harbor basin. This S-shaped harbor basin is, uh, is roughly 25,000 square meters, to give you an idea about the size. Then we come into this little island monument, the mysterious island monument. We call it the mysterious island monument because we don't know what it is yet. It can be a statue base, it can be a, it can be a sanctuary. It, unlikely it's a central harbor office, but it has been suggested. I have even suggested to call it the oyster bar. You will see why in seconds. But we shall return to uh, to this uh, very interesting monument later in the lecture. So here we leave the mysterious island monument, having a zoom out over Harbour Basin 3, going back through the canal, back through Harbour Basin 1, which is in this area here, through the entrance canal to the mouth of the entrance canal, which we have here. The entrance canal is uh, is uh, flanked by two moles, mole 4 and mole 5. And uh, the width from here to here is about, uh, about 60 meters. And uh, this mole we followed for 85 meters and it's 8 meters wide. And this one will follow for roughly 60 meters. But to give you an idea about the size, we have a, a flyover Mole 4 goes out here, takes a turn, and note this area where we did excavation into the foundation, so I'll return to that. We have Mole 4 here. And to give you an idea of the size of this, uh, this entrance canal, we have two divers excavating here. So, here we have Mesmer or Nielsen. He's about the same upper body uh, size as me, so you can have an idea that these are really big blocks. And as you can see, this area has been hit by a high energy impact, probably an earthquake. I'll return to two earthquakes that we have identified in the archaeological material. Here, Mess is, uh, is excavating uh, in the foundations of the mole at the turn I just showed you. And you can see these amazingly well-preserved oak posts here that are holding back uh, the foundations of the mole. And here we have Angeliki Sisi, our conservator. By we are excavating important structures like this, we have a, a conservator making sure that we are not compromising the structural integrity of, uh, of, uh, of these. The reason why uh, we're finding so much wood in the kind is that there's a, a lot of fresh water streaming out from the lagoon area. It was, uh, first it was a river, then it turned into a lagoon area, then they dug out the harbors, I'll return to that. But the fact that water is streaming out is scaring away the evil shipworm that eats wood, shipwrecks and everything. They, uh, they don't like when there's no salt in the water, so they are they are running away from this area and we are very happy about that because as you will see in this lecture wood and organic material is some of the most important finds that we have. I should also say that the conservator, she has the right to say stop during excavation if she feels that the structure is compromised. So here you see a section, you can even see where the 
that where they, they have been exposed and the sea and the currents have been eating away at these wooden posts. We found 36 in an area of 6 meters. We excavated this corner here or this turn to, in, the, in mode 4 to see if it was two different, um, two different uh, orientations. It wasn't. Yeah, well, it was two different orientations, but it wasn't two different building phases. We also had posts internally in the field, in the field, uh, stabilizing uh, the structure. So here you have an artistic reconstruction of the posts holding back the field with a nice surface here. He even drew our project mascot, Argos. And you can also see the wood also help protect ships mooring. At, the, at this mole, and I mean, this is something that we see also today in, uh, in modern harbors. Here we're flying over the other side of uh, the entrance canal, and we're excavating the front of it. We have Dina excavating uh, in front, and you can see these massive leg clamps of the 4th uh, to 3rd century BC, I mean they're half a meter, it's really a serious uh, foundation perhaps for a tower or fortification wall guarding the entrance of the harbor in Greek times. But as, as, in, the other, as in the other mode you can see that this part of the harbor front has been hit by a high impact, uh, high energy impact and it has also been undermined. Here we see Janus Nakas drawing the details of the clamps. And here is an artistic uh, reconstruction of the entrance canal in Roman times. The canal was 30 to 50 meters wide and the canal itself could also have been used as a harbor basin because it is quite substantial going into harbor basin 1 and then further into uh, to harbor basin 3 you can see our optimistic <laughs> reconstruction of this one and two weeks our return. So, also two of the prominent features of Lekayan in the outer harbor of Lekayan are the two moles, mole LN1, which we have here, and mole 2. These, uh, I, I was in Radio 24, and I said that these structures are so big, so you can see them from space, and I was very happy <laughs> that uh, <laughs> that I actually had some really nice high resolution satellite imagery and you can see them from space so I wasn't going into detector. Only Danes will understand that. So here we have mole, uh, mole 1. It's uh, quite wide up to 22 meters and we're following it for 45 meters. It has a square foundation here which is around 12 to 13 meters by 12 to 13 meters. It's this area here. And we do have illustrations uh, from, uh, from Roman coins of the late second century AD of, uh, of lighthouses. We know from Pausanias that there's a lighthouse in the other harbor of, uh, of, um, of Corinth, Kinkale. But the foundations on Mole 1 is a, it's, it's a possibility, we simply don't know yet, only excavation will show, but uh, it's a likely candidate for, uh, for, uh, for a lighthouse, also because it is the first major structure you see when you come sailing through the Corinthian Canal, not the Corinthian Canal, the <laughs> Corinthian Gulf from, uh, from the western Mediterranean. So it would have been standing in this area here, which we are flying over now, and now we'll have a look at Mole 2. Again, really hard etched monumental architecture, 50 meters long, 18 meters wide, preserved to a height of 4 meters. We go down and see the work of the divers. Here you see Mate excavating the foundations of, uh, of this mole and uh, we wet sift everything and we actually did find uh, 
organic material here, which will be very helpful in, uh, in dating this structure. As you can see, the props are massive, around five tons each. We even have a little mason mark here. Alexis is pointing out that this may be the mud line of, uh, of, the, of the original uh, harbor depth. We don't know yet. So we're returning to the mysterious island monument. You can see people wet sitting here. The important archaeological layers here, we, uh, we simply sift everything and we're very happy that we did that because we found some wonderful things which I'll show you in a second. So we, here we have Mess excavating the famous post. You can almost see it there. And here you see it. It's a, it's a Jumit per stake. And look at the preservation. I mean, it looks like it was hammered down yesterday. I mean, this kind of, of preservation you very, very rarely see in, in the Mediterranean. Also, you can see here that a lot of large blocks, even in this small area that we have excavated, has been strewn out of, uh, out of context. And uh, the whole monument has been liquefied in the northern, uh, northern uh, direction. It means that the, that the foundations have simply slumped down and uh, the monument has been falling in the northern direction. Obviously, also in this area, here. I'll just return to the podium for a short while. So, in 446 BC, the Roman general Scipio Maelius defeated the Carthaginians in the third and final war, thereby greatly increasing Rome's hold over the western Mediterranean. The same year, the Roman general Lucius Mummius defeated Greece's Achaean League and laid Corinth to waste. Reduced to a mere village, the city's trade networks collapsed. Over a century would pass before Corinth was refounded, this time by Julius Caesar, who recognized Corinth's strategic position in 44 BC he named the new colony in honor of himself. Colonia Laos Julia Corinthians. The resurrected city flourished in various degrees for the rest of antiquity and beyond. For almost two decades, I've been hunting for the perfect archaeological context where all the organic material normally not found on land, is preserved. And this year, that is last year, we finally discovered it. It was, I was joking that I would rather find a wooden spoon than a statue, and we did find archaeological layers where almost everything is preserved. Consider... Sorry. Consider the pristine preservation of the roughly 2,000-year-old wooden post you just saw, and I'll just have to scroll forward a little. I'll return to this. And this wooden object, I mean, it may be from a chair, either the tops or the feet of a chair. It's not a lot, but in classical archaeology, we it's very rare that we find these these items. So uh, consider the pristine preservation of the roughly 2,000 year old wooden post you just saw and this wooden object and imagine how well preserved wood and other organic material still lie at the bottom of this harbor. The potential for more unique discoveries is mind-blowing. We've also found all kinds of seeds, nuts and fruit kernels, bones with cock marks, a wooden block used from the rigging in, in a ship, and much more. As a part of our research for the center, as a part of our, our research, the Center of Geogenetics, University of Copenhagen, 
will extract and analyze the ancient uh, environmental DNA from the important archaeological deposits and attempt to reconstruct the past environment genetically. Recently, they have shown that ancient DNA in deposits can identify a wide variety of organism, everything from bacteria to plants and animals. Hence, they will characterize what lived in the area of Lycaon during various phases of antiquity, including the Roman period. Thus, we are within the research project. We are discovering everything from the DNA evidence to monumental molds constructed of five tons blocks, as you just saw. Then I will go back again. So, I didn't caption this photo because this is really what archaeology is about. Next to uh, the mysterious island monument, we found this small anchor from, that belongs to the first half of the first uh, second century AD. As you can see, it was a very difficult excavation. We call it amphibious archaeology because you're basically working in an environment where you don't know if you're going to soak it dry, as we did there, here, or if you're going to dive uh, your trench. For example, Antoine, our geoarchaeologist, was in Lecture last week, and there's now one meter of water in the, in the harbor basin free. It'll take quite a few pumps to pump that dry, but I actually think that we can do it. Here we see the trench in a photogrammetry movie made by Adele. Adeline, sorry. And we're zooming down to this uh, oyster layer, which is the important layer where we found all the nice things. And I'll also show you some more, more objects. The lower part of this uh, layer is dated to the first half of the first century AD. We're going over, you can see the foundations have been liquefied, causing the collapse of the monument. And I'll just show you because somehow you always see very interesting things in the bolts that is in the side of the trenches. And if you look at this, we actually have a huge piece of work marble. I mean, we have tried, I think everybody in the project has had a hand and tried to see if there's anything anything on it, but this is definitely a part that we will excavate next year. It's probably a marble block from, uh, from the facade of, uh, of the monument. Here we have it again, the wooden pieces. And we've also found glass. Here's the base of a glass ball. And we also found that this is really nice when you find ceramics like this. This is a, this is an Eastern Sigillata A ball with an inscription saying Alessandra, maybe an Italian uh, form of Alexandra or Alexander. We don't know yet. <laughs> I have to say that you can say photo by Bjarne Wayne. This this was just uh, cleaned yesterday at the effort, and this inscription came out from the owner of the, of the cup. So this is taken with my iPhone. So, <laughs> and also we found uh, there's uh, a production stamp showing which, uh, which shop produced it, which you see here. And I'm grateful for Guy Sanders who, uh, who had a look today because he actually produced, uh, produced this, this evidence. Uh, in the time span between 11.30 and uh, 4 o'clock. So this is totally new, uh, new evidence. We have found a lot of whole, uh, whole objects uh, in this little area. We also found two lamps. And uh, I'll actually return to, to this slide in a second. No, let's take it now. It's, it's from our, it's, it's from the, the news coverage, and the news coverage this year really illustrated how important uh, Lecchio and, uh, and Corinth in, in the Roman times are for, uh, for Christian people, because we have this photo, I think it's the first example of St. Paul diving with Matthew. 
<laughs> and we also, I mean, this is from Vietnam, especially in South and Africa, we had thousands of, uh, of people uh, uh, reading the articles which were published there. And we, even in Pakistan, there was uh, a local newspaper for Christian minority who had us covered there, so I was really, really impressed how wide it, it went around. So, the island monument, it was destroyed by, uh, it didn't stand for a long time. Mole 2 and the monument are constructed on exactly the same orientation and in all probability belong to the building program of, uh, of, uh, of Caesar. But we have to get a little further down into the excavation trades to be absolutely sure about that. What we did learn from the monument is that between 50 AD and 125 AD, there's a major earthquake which destroys the monument, and it may be uh, the the earthquake that is uh, that is uh, documented under Vespasian in 70 AD. So this monument may be the only evidence of this earthquake in Corinth. We're very, I mean, archaeologists they love earthquakes because people are going through their everyday routines in their homes, sitting in their boats in the harbor, doing what you do on every day, and then suddenly, boom, it's destroyed, and boats sink, and everything, <laughs> you're bomb bad and everything, and run away. And that makes some beautiful deposits for us archaeologists. So earthquakes are wonderful for us, but probably not as wonderful, <laughs> at especially this one. So it destroys the monument, but we still have, uh, I mean, these are what we know of the Roman period. We have the entrance canal going into Basin 1. There's a small appendix here we don't fully understand. It's about 40,000 square meters. And then Basin 3, around 25,000 square meters. And then the harbor is uh, living its happy life until uh, someday in the 6th century AD when, boom, again, a major earthquake. And we can see on lithophagos, which are stone-eating snails, which only live uh, close to the sea surface, that the monument has been lifted up one meter and ten. So major parts of the harbor simply went out of use. I mean, they would have been coming down to the harbor, and it would be the sea level would have been one meter and ten lower, which is a lot in antiquity, where harbor basins were rarely more than two to three meters deep. So they took this part of Basin 1 out, you remember the 105 meter long key here, and they shoveled all the sediments into big, uh, big piles. We don't know if parts of these uh, hills were also dug out when they dug the harbor into the natural lagoon area, but we'll have to put geological drills into it in the future. Basin 1, 4 was constructed, a whole new, new uh, basin, and also this part here was, uh, was constructed. We did a drill through this one and it went through 15 meters of pebbles, which is quite a lot. And you have the famous Leonidas Specifica here. So here's the drill that we did in Harbor Basin 4. Nice big Mac Mac style uh, drilling machine here. And here you see the drill. And what is interesting, what you need to, s to pay attention to is the is this area here starting from around 2 meters going down to 3 meters and 50. So here we have Dr. Papa Theodoros team doing a geomagnetic analysis of the canal and here we have this 105 meter long key that was constructed when this part, the other part of the harbor basin went out of use and here we have Antoine and Hugo drilling with a smaller mechanical drill into the sediments of Harbor Basin 1 and boom, there was a nice piece of, uh, of wood which dated, for now we have to do more course, but it dates the use of the Harbor Basin to around 85 AD. But see how, uh, see how uh, shallow it is, here it's from 80 centimeters going, uh, going down to, uh, to uh, yeah, maybe it was also in use here, but you can see it. It has been lifted up quite uh, quite markedly. 
So again, major earthquake, these areas go down fuse, and we have Harbor Basin 4, which we see here in a, in a very rough uh, reconstruction, because we basically, we basically only know that the, there is a Harbor Basin in this area here, so this is based on the landscape mode model. We'll have to do extensive investigations of it, this area to get the hard edges of, of the harbor basin. But I'm quite sure that uh, ending this lecture, we'll have a look at this nice little structure here, which is mode three. It is constructed by caissons, which was invented by the Romans in the first century BC. The Romans used very expensive portulano ash, ash to make uh, to make uh, concrete that would sit under water, and they placed uh, they placed them in big wooden modules, as we also do today, and sank them and used them as the foundations for harbor harbor structures such as moles and harbor fronts. And then we have a fly over here of uh, of mole three. You can see Vasilis is, uh, is doing t detailed photography. He's the photographer who's taken the video that you have seen in during this lecture. He's doing detailed photography of all the all the features of this case on. Here we have Jan Sabun. This excavating in the field between two uh, two caissons. It's a paper field. They probably just used what was available on the beach. But also in this film we're finding, what is that? He plays the bread so it doesn't suck on anything else than his arm. And there we have it. Is that, is that uh, the remains of an early Byzantine lunch? It's an uh, olive uh, pit. We also found bones and teeth in, uh, during the excavation here. Here we have the, the detailed excavation. I mean, this is the final uh, phase of the excavation where the structure is uh, clean for photogrammetry, it's clean for digital survey and for publication photographs. But this sequence here is also met a, uh, we had taken some photographs the day before and there were some pebbles lying on the wood and I said, I don't want a single grain of sand on, uh, on the wood. So here he's cleaning it very carefully. As you'll see, the photos turned out very nicely. The, we don't take very many students, normally only four or five, because we are very serious about our student training. Here you just have a, a view of it. I mean, this is 6th century AD, so this wooden box is 1400 years old, and it has been preserved in the surf zone in the outer harbor. Here we're zooming out. We chose to uh, to excavate this part here as a part of the bottom was already exposed when we found it. It was this area here in case in five. So we excavated this part here. So we basically we only excavated what we needed. I should say that it is preserved for around 55 meters and it is 13 meters wide. So here you have the corner which was exposed, which we cleaned and. Uh, and documented, and as you can see, we have all the information, we have the posts, and we have the beams of the floor and the planks of the floor, and then we have concrete and mortar in this area here. As you can see, this is the northern side. We excavated enough to get get the get the information that we needed. The posts are cypress, and the planks are pine. I have to stress that this is this is a, a macro. Uh, analysis. We'll have to do thin section analysis as well, and that will actually happen next next uh, month in uh, in England. Amazing preservation, and as you can see, it is almost made as a sled. This is going seaward, so it's following the natural bottom of uh, of uh, the sea bottom, which is sloping towards the sea, and this is going from. Uh, from west to east, it has tipped to the side either because it was undermined or because 
it was placed a bit sloppy, but it doesn't really matter because you can always adjust in the higher structure, in the actual surface of the mold. So here we have it again. And I want to mention the Leonidas Basilica as well. It's a 200 meter long basilica when it was constructed and stood in the, in the 6th century AD. It was the largest basilica in the known world. It was even larger than the first phase of the St. Peter's Cathedral in Rome. This, uh, it only stood very shortly, unfortunately, this, uh, this major and important basilica. It was destroyed by another earthquake in, late, in the late 6th century AD, early 7th century AD. But I find it amazing that we found one harbor structure and in all probability the harbor basin which was associated to the Leonidas Basilica that we can imagine that pilgrims and, and people, people who are trading were arriving at Corinth and, and entering the, the Leonidas Basilica and it of course also shows that Lecaean being able to build such a major landmark and reorganizing its harbor after an earthquake early in the 6th century AD, that, that they, it was really an important city. And I sometimes tease Guy Sanders that maybe, maybe uh, Lecaean had taken over from Corinth at, uh, at this time. Finally, I want to stress that I'm just standing here as one of the many people who work on, on the project and archaeology today is really a multidisciplinary teamwork of many different fields, especially at the, especially at the Lake Iron, the geology, the geoarchaeology, the geophysics that we do in the, in the sea and in the water areas with Dr. Papa Theodoro and the, and the the geomorphology and geoarchaeology that we're doing with, uh, with the University of Lyon, with uh, Jean-Philippe Roulin and, and uh, Antoine Chabon and Hugo Delille and many others is, is almost as important as the archaeology. And now I, I have a dry, I could really use a Carlsberg now. So I think, I think this is it. Uh, dear audience, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much.